yeah, so unfortunately Dr. Ming can't be here, so she's asked me to give this uh, talk today. Um, so yeah, I, I'm John, and I'm the project manager for the uh, Dialens project. Uh, I mostly focus on the technical side of the project, uh, so the Dialens apps and the web-based systems that we have. Um, so if you have questions, uh, I'll try my best. Uh, from a technical perspective, I could probably answer better, but it might be good if you have questions, you can directly contact Dr. Ming, and she'll reply. <clears throat> so, uh, if we start off by trying to set the scene. So, diabetes is uh, kind of a world epidemic, and the number of diabetes sufferers is growing. Um, and here, as we can see on the slide, that uh, China and India have a large number of diabetes sufferers. Also, diabetes is part of this group called the three H's, which is uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hyperglycemia. Um, and this uh, three H's is becoming a big uh, topic uh, in Singapore and outside of Singapore as well. <clears throat> Focusing specifically on Singapore, Singapore in 2014 had uh, approximately 440,000 diabetes sufferers. And this is expected to grow to about 1 million by uh, 2050. Um, and this is uh, going to be a huge cost burden, um, not, uh, not only on the people, on the diabetes sufferers, but also um, on the country itself. <clears throat> if we now take a deeper look at, uh, the, 3H, at the 3 H's, um, here we can see that the majority of patients are found in the low risk category, so in the uh, lower part of the pyramid. And the number of patients decreases as you go up the pyramid. Uh, so the, the high risk category has a uh, fewer number of uh, patients. We can also see that um, the majority of patients here requires effective self-management uh, by, by the yellow triangle. So the majority of patients need self-management. <clears throat> and the medical research community has explored various methods for uh, chronic 3H care. Um, and a review found that uh, approximately 45% of clinical studies proved that self-care management is successful. Uh, furthermore, nutritional practices alone can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by 60%. So, if the solution has been found, is kind of the question of what are we waiting for? And there are some key problems that are, uh, you know, preventing this uh, field moving forward. So the first is um, they use very labor-intensive approaches. So they use um, kind of paper-based methods for food diary recording, uh, which which just aren't scalable and sustainable. You can't you can't really do it over a long period and. Uh, because it's labor intensive, it requires a lot of number of people, and when you start to try and apply that to a whole country, it just it costs a lot and it consumes a lot of resources. Um, also, the promotion of sustained healthy eating habits and exercise have mostly been unsuccessful. And this is due to a lack of ways to accurately record, uh, for example, food intake, and uh, do this in real time to provide automatic feedback to the person. So there's normally a delay, like if you have the paper-based approach, um, the user or, the, or the, the patient records down what they eat, and then um, there's a period of time before feedback can be provided to the patient uh, on, on their eating. <clears throat> Therefore, under the ALIVE project, we aim to provide our solution for sustainable, uh, sustainable self-management support and decision support. If we look at uh, the disease factors that can be managed by patients themselves, a person's uh, health can be broken down into these four categories. Uh, so demographics, genetics, healthcare, and lifestyle. <clears throat> lifestyle, uh, only lifestyle here has modifiable factors. Um, and therefore, this is where we start our AI innovation um, with lifestyle data gathering. The availability of large-scale longitudinal lifestyle data is key to predicting and tackling the 3H risks and to develop effective uh, preventative solutions. 
So once the data has been gathered, the next steps are data analytics and then uh, intervention, action planning, and sharing. So, so we have kind of three steps. We have the, we, we have the first uh, data gathering, data analytics, and then action planning. For the data gathering, we need accurate and scalable ways to log food intake and physical exercises. For data analytics, we need to construct a dynamic healthcare uh, knowledge graph from medical ontologies to support contextualized recommendations. And then finally, we need to place users as the owners of their data. Um, and therefore, we need to utilize technologies such as uh, blockchain-based technologies for data security and incentives for data sharing. Additionally, we'll also explore blockchain-based private machine learning to allow for a wide range of analytics to be done by multiple parties without revealing the data. So the, the four key AI technologies underpinning this research include advanced AI lifestyle analytics, private and explainable machine learning, personalized nudging and influence, and incentives for data sharing and analytics. Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, I, I have a few slides in a minute uh, that I think we'll touch on that. So just to explain quickly, um, initially um, the app, so in the initial stage, the app um, uh, and the, and the web-based systems uh, underpinning that only communicated uh, between the user. Uh, but we've now since expanded that uh, with, with projects that are going on um, with SGH to, to look at ways of then also uh, taking what we have uh, from, from the app side and then providing it to, to uh, doctors. So yeah, I, I'll explain a bit more. In that. <clears throat> so um, diet is the, one of the most important factors uh, that can be modified. Um, however, it's also the most challenging and also the most tedious to collect as we discussed with the labor-intensive approaches. Currently, the most convenient way to log nutritional information is to use image recognition um, with the use of uh, mobile device cameras. Um, so, so everybody has uh, a mobile phone uh, these days that has a pretty good camera. So that's a good way of recording um, food intake. Uh, this is also an area where we've made significant process. And uh, on this slide, you can see our current multi-resolution food recognition framework here. <clears throat> uh, the ingredient and the cutting attribute uh, probability distributions on each region are learned with a regional-wise multitask model and then matched against the nutritional information data, uh, database. So, so we kind of have the, the image recognition side uh, this is in the web-based system, so the image recognition side, the, the nutritional database, and then we, we kind of connect the two um, to provide the user with um, accurate nutritional information um, in real time via the app. Uh, we have achieved 95% accuracy in the top 20 results. So uh, we've also looked into retrieval-based approaches uh, for location-specific food, such as uh, restaurant and hawker food. And our current model contains uh, over 1,000 categories uh, in classification and 87,000 dishes in retrieval. Uh, and in the future, we would like to expand to um, sensor-based approaches, such as using devices that attach uh, to your teeth, which I hadn't heard of before. <laughs> apparently, yeah. apparently you can get sensors that attach to your teeth and while you're eating they can uh, record certain stuff, yeah. Another key attribute um, is also um, uh, exercise. Uh, and this can also be uh, tracked using mobile devices again. Um, and also wearable devices, which is uh, a growing area. Uh, so we also plan to not only uh, classify the exercise-related activity, but also the fine grain activity to complete the user health profile and provide context for action planning. Uh, and I think what's important here is to 
uh, highlight the, the context. Uh, when we take in this information, it always needs to be put into a context. <clears throat> so um, you can see on this slide, uh, we have some uh, data gathered from certain devices, and this is actually uh, data gathered from Dr. Ming. So Dr. Ming actually used these uh, devices, and, and uh, th this is the data that she gathered. Um, so these provide instant feedback of health status, uh, which is important for self-management. Um, when it comes to self-management, you always need that feedback loop to the user, and it always needs to be done very fairly quickly. If it takes too long, um, the user's not happy. <clears throat> um, so now let's look at the, the, the diet lens, so the, the, the app-based wellness ecosystem. So here, the, the diet lens app is in the center of the ecosystem, and it brings together the important aspects of uh, wellness. So uh, firstly, we have the, the user and the user data, such as their diet and their activity, uh, and there's that interaction between the user and the app. We also have the doctor and the researchers um, that are using the, the ecosystem as well. And then we're bringing in this knowledge graph discussed earlier uh, into the equation. And we're also using social, social networks. Um, and social networks play a, a big factor in self-management. Um, they, they seem to be um, quite effective uh, with users um, in that they can share what they're doing and people can uh, help uh, support them in what they do. <clears throat> so here, here are some pictures of uh, the Diet Lens app. Uh, so we, we've built a prototype personal assistant app, uh, both on the iOS and on the uh, Android um, OSs. And uh, in the process, we're also developing the, the AI-based technologies. Uh, and these include um, now food tracking, uh, activity tracking, and health data logging. So uh, as you can see here in this image, there's a picture of uh, what looks like a breakfast dish. And then we use the nutritional database to then bring in the nutritional information, which we provide to the user. <clears throat> we also look to add a sensor data, uh, a sensor data collection as well. Um, for example, uh, wirelessly through Bluetooth. Um, so, so we're looking at those options, for example, like weighing scales, also, um, uh, glucose monitors. <clears throat> um, the intervention functions that are planned uh, includes cognitive uh, training games, uh, nudge engines, and a multimodal conversation agent, e.g. Uh, a chatbot. Uh, so, so the previous speaker, Joseph, uh, discussed uh, dynamic self-improvement through A-B testing, um, which will be used in the nudge engine. So. Um, it's kind of no good um, giving the user nutritional information. You also need to kind of help them in their way towards a better lifestyle. You need, you need to kind of show them the path that they need to take. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit of uh, inertia involved in that process. So you, you can't just give them a big task. They need the small uh, fine-grained steps to, to get them there. So going back to this question, now, now we have uh, what we've developed is a clinical platform. Um, so what this platform allows is for uh, a connection between the user and the Dialense app with uh, this clinical platform. So what that means in a technical implementation perspective is that um, doctors can go onto this platform. Uh, they can register, they can create a group on this platform. Every group has an associated QR code. The user can then scan that QR code to be automatically added to that group. Uh, and uh, each group will have particular settings um, that will be recorded. For example, step count, uh, food log, etc. cetera. Um, the doctor can then go to that group see all the patients under that group, and then they can specifically go into a patient and see that information uh, that the user um, has allowed. Um, so for example, here we, we can see that we have the calories, the step count, also their food diary, so broken down into the 
uh, into each dish that they've eaten, and then uh, the sort of macro and micronutrients of that of that dish. Uh, and, th and this is what we're trying out with SGH at the moment. Uh, but SGH is in particular doing it with uh, uh, iodine uh, and iodine levels. Oh. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it, essentially what SGH has done is um, they've uh, labeled the food in the database to say whether it's uh, safe to eat in terms of an iodine perspective or not, uh, so that the user can just simply take a picture of the dish and then know whether it's safe for them to eat or whether they should avoid that dish. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, My, my understanding is that um, the, the doctors in particular that are using this um, will ask the patient if they'd, lead to, if they'd like to be part of uh, this, this study uh, or, or part of this, uh, this group as, as a method for them to find out whether they can eat a dish or not. Um, So this, this is uh, actually the, the, the study hasn't started yet, so we've just handed over the systems and stuff to, to SGH, and I think uh, within the next week or so they're going to they're gonna start. Uh, that information, I'm not sure if we'll have that. I'm not sure if it's part of the agreement that, that we'll have that information. <clears throat> so um, another, another aspect that we want to look at is um, a, a customizable uh, platform. Uh, and this is to allow tracking of any type of health data. Um, so yeah, we'd like to create this customizable platform. Uh, and what this platform will allow is for the user to enter uh, a photo and uh, some text, uh, and then for the system to respond in an appropriate way, with an appropriate way of uh, monitoring that, that uh, health data over time. Uh, so in summary, <clears throat> The Dilemmas project aims to tackle the problem of three H's, hyperglycemia, uh, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia by leveraging AI technologies to facilitate self-management and to support primary care practitioners. Um, this is challenging because it's large scale. Uh, data collection is continuous and long term, uh, and it needs to be personalized to have optimal effect, uh, and it must be affordable. Um, so it has all these key challenges to it. Um, for example, collecting the uh, food images and then training a model with those food images is very costly. Um, and yet, at the same time, it has to be affordable for the user to be able to access. So. <clears throat> uh, Yeah, so, so these, these are some of the key challenges uh, we have when uh, training the, the machine learning model. So um, actually, we, we found, surprisingly, that um, for certain drinks, the, the models are able to distinguish um, certain categories like that, um, which was kind of surprising. We thought that it wouldn't be able to, but there are some drinks where, at the same time, it can't distinguish. Um, so yeah. Um, and to, yeah, we also, that's another challenge, is getting accurate labeling, making sure we get accurate labeling. Uh, another key challenge is um, consistency in terminology. So w what we found is that uh, a dish or a drink may have several different names for it, which obviously is kind of challenging. You get like duplicates and things. Uh, also, between, between the languages, the, the naming is slightly different between Chinese and English could be slightly different. Um, also, you, you start getting like brands into play and the brands have like these weird long names, you know, things like that. So it's very challenging to keep the database um, it, data uh, clean and accurate and, and it's, a, it's a big project, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so <clears throat> the, the current implementation of the app is um, that when the user takes a picture uh, of, let's say, a dish, um, the app then sends it off to the uh, recognition engine, and then it returns back a list of items that it thinks it is. The user then can select from that list of items uh, what the dish is. Uh, obviously, the, the list of items is ranked by confidence. Um, and uh, it, when, when you go into a food, you can then adjust uh, the portion size. Uh, but as, as was mentioned earlier, um, what, one of the challenges is providing accurate nutritional information. And the way you can have one dish cooked in several different ways that can't necessarily be picked up by, by the engine. Um, and the different ways it's cooked will mean that it has slightly different nutritional um, values, um, which is another key challenge. Um, yeah, so some of the things that we are looking at is using uh, localization uh, to try and um, say, okay, well, the user is in this area, so what issues can be found in this area? And can we provide more accurate nutritional information by that approach? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the machine learning uh, stuff, that's all in the cloud because uh, because of the models that we use, they're quite resource intensive. So they they actually require uh, GPUs to to run to do in a kind of real time. Yeah. 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 That, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, you, you mean like communication? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think, I mean, obviously, if the network isn't there, uh, you know, there's no 4G, then there's no communication between the app and the, the cloud systems. So, uh, you, you can't get anything. So, it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, re it returns back that uh, we see there's no network connection, so we can't communicate. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, doing doing kind of like machine learning on on uh, the phone. Uh, com yeah, uh, the technology is just not there. I mean, there are AI chips now, mobile AI chips that can that can do it, but it's still not uh, that. Um, it's not that uh, saturated in the market of mobile phones. Um, and at the moment, the models that we use require a uh, GPU. So we actually have a GPU server to, to do the um, recognition in, you know, in a couple of seconds. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, okay. I think I think I see. Okay, I think I see what's uh, so. The the communication occurs when the user takes a picture of the dish. So the number of times that the app communicates with the cloud is based on the number of times the user takes an image. Yeah. Yeah. So. But that would happen internally in, in the cloud. There is, um, okay, if you go to more technical aspects, um, for example, we have, um, 
an economic bihun uh, model. So, so we have a, a model specifically for the dish economic bihun. So economic bihun is just uh, lots of um, food items together. So, you, so you, get, you get a variety. So we don't use the same model on that. So what happens is first we, we use the first model to recognize that it's economic bihun. And then the, the cloud system will then trigger uh, the economic bihun model in the background. What will happen is the list will then get returned to the user with the economic bihun as an item. And then if the user clicks economic bihun on the app, the app will use the task ID that the back end has provided to then retrieve the uh, economic bihun data. <clears throat> so, so the economic bihun can actually be broken down into like, this is bihun and this is chicken and et cetera. Yeah, but again, that varies on uh, how much the user uses the app. So, so if the user doesn't even open the app on a day, it's not going to do any communication. Um, but if the user is using a lot, then yeah. Um, there, there is pushes in the sense of, uh, so I, I uh, mentioned about the nudge engine. And uh, what we set up is actually a push notification system to send notifications to the user. But these are only notifications. These aren't uh, data that's pushed. No, the, the, no, these notifications won't. The notifications are, uh, are going to be part of like a, a nudge engine that uh, tries to uh, get the user to um, to do to do certain things, like to, to take more, some more steps or drink some more water or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose it, I suppose it could take into the context. Ah, uh, so. Hmm. Understand? Yeah. So um, I think to do real-time communication on the app between uh, the the app and the cloud system is um, not a viable solution because what's going to happen is that's going to drain the battery of the user uh, quite fast, uh, and I don't think the, the the user would like that as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's so battery life is quite a big factor for for users. If a user downloads an app and it consumes their battery life, they are going to uninstall that app pretty quickly because because ba batteries on phones aren't great. Uh, they're getting better, but they're not great. Um, so we have to factor that in into our communication. We have to minimize the amount. Uh, network calls are quite a big uh, battery consumer. Um, I see your point about the, the, the context. Um, some of the ways we mitigate that is by, um, we set a time, uh, for example, in the morning, so the user hasn't used the app overnight necessarily. Uh, we're assuming the user won't use the app overnight. Um, and then uh, in the, in, we, we have then the context, like relatively up-to-date context, uh, which we can then provide in the morning with a notification. Um, yeah. Um, also, to, to, to point on the, some of the health data aspects, some of the data, for example, step count, comes from um, the App Health and the Google Fit um, uh, apps. So, um, yeah, we, we, we basically sync that data. Uh, I don't know if that can be done in real time. And if it can be done in real time, whether it can be done efficiently, so it doesn't consume resources, yeah. yeah. And most users these days turn off background um, background updates, so it's not realistic to assume that the user is going to allow us to run our app in the background all the time. <coughs> yeah.
Uh, in, into the app? Yeah, in your app. Yeah, as many times as the user wants to do a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So so the app allows the user to. Um, update as many times a day as they want. Uh, there's no restriction on how many times the user can update their information. Um, you know, the, the user can do it as, as fine grain as, as soon as they get a dish, they take a picture and upload it to the app, or they can do it once a day. They just collect all the images and then they just feed it into the app. Uh, so so the, the app allows the user to input multiple images into the app. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, so the, the way the app is structured is via a daily food diary. So there's a, there's a food diary page that's, that's broken into day pages. So, so it's, it's just a daily food diary. Yeah. Yeah, so. No, no. <clears throat> so, so yeah, so the, the user can just take a photo with their phone camera, not even using the camera option on the app. And then they can just go into the gallery inside the app and upload the photo, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. The, when the user takes um, an image, um, uh, it has certain uh, attributes to it, and we can extract those attributes like time and uh, location. Yeah. Obviously, the location is dependent on the user turning on GPS for photos. Any more questions? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, we've yeah, it's yeah, it is, it is, it is quite a large system. It has these many aspects to it. We've done some trials. Um, we found um, from the trials, we've been able to find some areas that need changing, um, some good points about the app, some bad points about the app um, from those trials. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the app store. Uh, it's called the uh, Dial Lens. Uh, yes, I, I think it's dialens.com, yeah. So I think I think uh, the so what would be so I, I think we discussed the, um, the the real time aspect is not really realistic. So the 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 real timeness of the data depends on how many times the user goes into the app, and the and the app can then communicate with the with the cloud system. So um, it does depend on that aspect. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, so, so the, the whole assumption is that the user has a network connection, yeah, uh, all the time when using the app. That, that, uh, yeah, I, I, have, I have encountered some, uh, some locations where there's not great connectivity, but most of the time I have 4G, uh, personally.
Sorry, say again. Oh, I said that there is a thing that the system Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If if you if you yeah, so in the instances where I, I can't use the app because of the network connection, I can just take a picture on my phone. Yeah, and then do it later. I think I think generally Singapore has quite a good uh, mobile network system. Um, generally, um, sure, sure, but uh, that's not necessarily a problem we can overcome uh, unless we go out to each basement and install some kind of like network system. <laughs> um, I think I think to try and overcome that would be unrealistic for us. That would need to more be on like a telecoms uh, a telecom side. Yeah, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. That that's that's a good implementation to to overcome uh, no network. Um, um, I think that would also depend on whether the users allowed background activity. Or, or so do you have to reopen the app or, or it will just work in the background? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a good implementation. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the implementations of uh, getting over the network issue, for example, uh, Instagram is probably one of the best examples for this, um, uh, when you like a photo on Instagram, it happens instantly, right? There is no delay, except in the world of the internet, that is impossible. There is always a delay, no matter how fast the internet is, there will always be the handshake delay. Um, so what actually happens is locally on the phone, it has a state, um, this is a memory on the phone. and. Uh, it likes it locally on the phone, and then it sends off a network request in the background. If the network request fi fails, it keeps trying to a certain point. And then what happens is, if it keeps failing, it just drops it, as if you never liked the picture. The key point here is that you liking an image is not, is not uh, critical, right? If I like an image on Instagram and it doesn't actually like it, I don't really care. Is, is not, is not, it's not a critical action. So when, when you're looking at the network and how a critical a network communication is, you need to ask, do I need to make the user wait or do I not? Users hate waiting for actions to happen. They like immediate feedback because of how the world is. If you do something in the world, uh, in the environment, it happens instantly. They want the same thing to happen on the phone. But you need to ask, do I need to make the user wait because this is a critical action and they need to ensure it happens? Or can I just do it in the background, and if it doesn't happen, let it go? I, I think a lot of companies do this without people realizing. Um, yeah, you know, pr pretty much all companies do this because if you are made to wait for every network request, it's, it's annoying. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you.